again, my name is Joe Comerford. I'm delighted on behalf of my rocking food security chairs, co-chairs, uh, to welcome you here today to this briefing on food security and food insecurity in the Commonwealth. Let me start by shouting out to Reps Schmidt, Donahue, and Kane, uh, who are the House co-chairs, and also Senators Gobi and Lesser, uh, who join me on the Senate side. Um, Hannah Kane likes to say that the Food Systems Caucus uh, is the second largest caucus in the legislature, uh, just south of the Democratic Caucus. Um, and I will say, and I'm sure she would agree, that it's in large part that large because of the amazing effective advocate community uh, that keeps us tuned in to issues that are important to us in our Commonwealth. We have some of those amazing effective advocates with us today for this one hour briefing. Again, for folks just tuning in, we're gonna record this briefing. Uh, it's not for uh, public use, but it will be sent to offices. Um, so please let me start by welcoming uh, the advocates who have agreed to brief the legislature today on behalf of my co-chairs. Um, first up, uh, Winton Pitkoff. Winton is probably not a stranger to you. He heads up the Food Systems Collaborative, um, and he's the director of that. It's a network of organizations from all sectors of the food system working towards sustainable and equitable and resilient local food. Um, welcome, Winton. Christina Maxwell um, is the director of programs at the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts. Um, hails from my district, really happy to welcome you, Christina, which serves the four westernmost counties of the Commonwealth. And in that role, Christina oversees all food bank programs, inclu including nutrition, member capacity building, SNAP outreach, uh, and more. Um, and I will just say that Christina and all the food banks, as we probably really know, work very well and importantly, tightly together to galvanize their voice in the legislature. Um, welcome, Christina. Aaron McAleer from Project Bread. Of course, Project Bread is well known. Uh, president of Project Bread, Erin uses her background in public policy and health and human services to address food insecurity in Mass Massachusetts at the macro level. Um, Project Bread connects people and communities in Massachusetts to reliable sources of food while advocating for policies that make food more accessible. And as we know, uh, Project Bread has been an amazing, uh, an amazing and powerful driver of the legislature in terms of getting us to focus as a body on what's important. And then Phil Corman, um, welcome Phil from Community Involved in Sustaining Agriculture. Phil has been a community leader in Western Massachusetts for 30 years or more uh, and has served for uh, 12 years as the executive director of CESA. Again, CESA Community Involved in Sustaining Agriculture. CESA is a bi-local um, and Phil is deeply connected um, to the bi-locals, so he'll be able to speak from the position of bi-locals in our farms. Uh, CESA is the longest running bi-local agriculture group in the nation, actually. Uh, so it's really wonderful to have you, Phil. And then Frank Maracci uh, from the North sea Northeast Seafood Coalition. I'm particularly excited that Frank is here. Um, Frank lives in Situate and was a commercial fisherman for 54 years. Including, including serving as a deckhand on, and later owning and captaining a fishing vessel. And I, I think it's really exciting for us to see fisheries included in our conversations about food security. I know I see lots of my colleagues uh, and staff from, hello, hello, um, from, hi Sarah, Repik, um, from coastal communities, and we need to see common cause uh, between fisheries and farming communities, and it's exciting uh, that Frank's able to bring this to us. So that's the lineup. It's an all-star lineup. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to ask Winton to kick off and frame the big picture. He's going to turn it all over to Christina, and each is going to take about five minutes to run down their, their areas for us, giving us really critically needed information. Then we'll open it up to your questions. Um, so with that, I'm going to kick it over to Winton to frame us and and get us started and focused. Thank you, Senator Comerford, and, and thank you to the whole Food System Caucus for, for planning this briefing and for including me. Um, Winton, just unmute. I have unmuted. Yes. You can't hear me? Yes. Aaron can, can, Aaron can hear me, so I'm going to keep going. Okay, super. We can hear it. 
Um, so issues about food access quickly came to the fore for, for everyone in the state in March. Um, and this was expressed in terms of physical access uh, in, in the form of restaurants and institutions with food services shutting down, people having to suddenly shift from eating 50% of their meals at home to 100%. Schools shutting down, which meant that families of hundreds of thousands of kids who rely on school meals suddenly were without that resource. Shortages in some food items due to hoarding and breakdowns in the supply chain, uh, stores, farmers markets, and other retail spaces being physically unsafe for seniors and others with compromised immune systems. So they had to find other ways to physically access food. And public transportation being limited. So people who live in communities with limited retail and who don't have their own transportation were in a very real sense cut off from access to food. It was also expressed in terms of economic access to food. As people lost their income, more people became dependent upon an emergency food system that was already stretched thin and on state and federal benefit programs that helped close the gap between income and the cost of basic needs. And it was expressed in terms of the uncertainty for food producers about access to markets. Farmers and fishermen and food processors in Massachusetts rely on being able to sell much of what they produce to wholesale markets, restaurants and institutions but that was thrown into disarray, not just for products already produced, but this happened at a time when farmers who rely on market certainty in order to survive were trying to plan their crops for this year. And black communities and other communities of color, which have already been underserved by the food system for generations, have again been hit the hardest by all of these challenges, not just in terms of access to food, but also in terms of job losses, transportation challenges, and healthcare inequities. The state's response to all of these challenges was understandably a patchwork of disconnected efforts at first. Some good immediate relief in terms of exp expediting services and developing regulations, but also some real challenges around consistency and scale to meet the very sudden needs. In late April, the administration launched the Food Security Task Force, which was an effort to better coordinate those efforts and also to generate ideas for what more was needed in the task force was made up of representatives of state agencies as well as stakeholders and service providers from throughout the food system and throughout the state. And you've probably seen all the top line outcomes from that task force. There've been lots of press releases, uh, the $36 million food security infrastructure grant program, additional vendors and funding for the healthy incentives program, the online exchange to help connect Massachusetts food producers with buyers and other investments. And what also came out of it was the beginnings of a conversation about how the state can intervene in food access in ways that get at the root causes of these challenges rather than relying on the patchwork and charity models. And, and I say the beginnings of the conversation because there's still a lot more to do, both to address immediate needs as well as to ensure long-term sustainability throughout the food system. At the same time, community-based organizations and other stakeholders have stepped up with some incredibly innovative responses to food access challenges in the form of both practical on the ground programs and, and projects, as well as advocacy in terms of the need for greater investment and more responsive policy from the state. And what we've learned is how reliant we are on the food, local food system and how much better it can adapt in the face of sudden crises because of its reasonable scale and because of its connection to the communities that it serves. And the speakers today are going to talk about these on the ground efforts and crucially what make what these efforts tell us about policy, what policy changes are needed to make the local food system more resilient. And I'm going to emphasize that word resilient. We're responding to a very specific crisis right now, one that needs particular tools and resources in a very immediate sense. And the next crisis will be different and will need different tools. And so what we have to take away from this current situation is how do we strengthen the local food system? And that includes everyone from the producers of food to the people who eat it in ways that make it better able to withstand the next big set of challenges it's faced with, whatever that may be. And part of that is absolutely in the form of strengthening programs like HIP, increasing farmland protection, regulating food waste better, ensuring that we're making better use of all of the federal programs that are available to residents in need. But it also means integrating local food system needs in all of the important work that the legislature does climate change, transportation, healthcare, all the big issues and big efforts that you're tackling right now, not only impact the food system, but can also be better if food system stakeholders and their considerations are at the table in your discussions. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Christina. Thank you, Winton. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Senator Comerford, for the invitation. I'm really glad to have the opportunity to speak with all of you. So as Winton indicated, and, as, and I'm sure you all either know or can imagine, 
the emergency food system was hit hard right at the beginning of the pandemic. Within a day of the state essentially shutting down, we were seeing massive numbers of people coming to our agencies across the state. 64% uh, more people have sought food assistance um, between March and now as, ha as did at the same time period last year. So it's been a really significant increase that we've all had to face. Feeding America is now estimating that one in seven people in Massachusetts is going to be food insecure this year, which is up more than 50% over last year. So the need became very apparent very quickly and it was very large. Um, our agencies, there are about a thousand emergency food agencies across the state. Those are food pantries and meal sites. Um, they had to pivot very quickly in order to be able to get large quantities of food out to the people who needed it and to do it in a way that was safe for themselves and their volunteers and their staff. In many cases, they lost most of their volunteers because many of the volunteers tend to be elderly and were more at risk for COVID. So very understandably, they chose to stay home. Many of our agencies started doing their distributions outdoors which required a whole change in the logistics of how they operate. Uh, but they did a great job of that. They did that very quickly and they have been able to um, serve people uh, as they're coming. At the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts, we also do SNAP outreach and enrollment and we saw our SNAP applications increase by 213% right away. That then decreased a little bit and has stayed, stayed somewhat flat. Uh, but that put a real strain on our, our staff um, at the outset. We also were facing supply chain disruptions and getting enough food in the door. And we were also having a big challenge getting PPE and hand sanitizer, both for ourselves, our own staff, and for our agencies. So what kinds of successes did we see? I will never say that we're able to fully meet the need because we've never been able to fully meet the need of everyone in the Commonwealth who faces hunger, but we have largely been able to rise to the occasion and distribute 57% uh, more food across the state than we did last year. Um, this was due in part due to some really major investments by the state. Uh, we received some pre-packed boxes from MEMA that were incredibly helpful to us. Uh, and the legislature, of course, included an additional $9 million in MEFAP funding in the SUP budget in August. We have not seen that money yet, but we are very much looking forward to getting it. That will be incredibly helpful for us. And um, there were some federal programs, too, that really helped people out quite a lot. And that helped to um, prevent some people from needing to come to the emergency food uh, system to get food. So the stimulus checks that people got, the enhanced unemployment benefits, pandemic EBT, uh, there were flexibilities around the distribution of school and summer meals, and all of those programs were very, very helpful to individuals and families in need, and therefore to the food banks and uh, the, our member agencies. We would have been much worse off without all of those interventions. Another one of the big successes, I would say, uh, the, the silver linings that have come out of this period of time is that the food bank coalition, the four food banks across the state, as well as Project Bread, the Mass Law Reform Institute, um, and municipalities and state partners have really worked very closely together through this time and have really been able to uh, coalesce around a few specific um, ideas and, and uh, efforts that we needed to move forward. So I think that um, that conversation has been very, very fruitful. So planning, uh, moving forward right now, what we're looking at in the, in the short to medium term is planning for winter. Most of our agencies are gonna need to con continue to do their distributions outdoors and snow brings a whole other level of uh, logistical needs. So we're helping our agencies work on that. We're planning for the holidays, which is a time of major increase in the number of people that we see every year. And we really have no idea what to anticipate this year and what that's going to be like. Uh, we are continuing to face some challenges sourcing food, nowhere near the challenges that we were early on, but um, 
donations of food and federal sources of food are a little bit uncertain right now. And so for the food banks, MEFAP is becoming an increasingly important part of the food uh, inventory that we have on stock and that we're able to count on for the future. Um, and I'll just finish by saying that one of the things that we really worry about right now, in addition to those short-term things, are the people who we aren't seeing. The people who may be needing help and don't know how to get it, aren't sure where to turn, don't know who to call. There have been a lot of programs to try to uh, increase the efforts of, of outreach. Project Bread does a fantastic job with their hotline. All the food banks put out information. We're working with the media, uh, with the state, to try to get that word out. But I know that there are a lot of people who aren't coming to us who need to be. They might be facing immigration challenges. There might be language barriers. There are all sorts of situations. But those are the people that I worry about right now because I know they're out there and we need to find them. So I thank you very much for having me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And I believe now I'm turning it over to Phil Corman from CESA. Yep, and thank you, Christine. And thanks for underscoring MEFAP, both the MEFAP that you haven't gotten, but was in the SUP and the MEFAP coming up. And thank you to all the House and Senate colleagues who are here. Uh, you know, this is a perfectly timed uh, briefing in a sense as we are having budget meetings currently, right? Um, and we should and can foreground those of us who want to make this a priority, uh, MEFAP and HIP and other food security programs. Okay, Thank over to you, Phil. Thank you. Thanks so much. I really appreciate being part of this and seeing so many familiar pay, play, uh, folks that uh, often I only see as I walk through on Ag Day. So it's great to see you all in one place. Um, so CISA is one of the nine bilocals, uh, all independent nonprofit groups, and we cover every acre of Massachusetts and probably work with about 800 different farms throughout the Commonwealth. And when COVID hit in mid-March and the governor declared the pandemic effectively here, um, that as Witten had mentioned already, restaurants closed, the colleges closed, the public schools closed, the winter farmers markets closed, um, sugar houses closed, dear to Witten's heart and my heart. And uh, that meant that farmers who did have items to sell no longer had a consumer base. They didn't have it locally, they didn't have it statewide, and they didn't have it nationally. And as a result, um, there was a total scramble about how to reinvent one's business in mid-March. Um, we walked through with a number of farm businesses that did reinvent we were able to provide resources, literally grant money so that they could set up websites, buy delivery trucks and start delivering food to homes. We had two home delivery farm service programs that were run by individual farms that literally were delivering to 1500 farms. This at times was the only person these people were seeing. Um, that has totally leveled off now that people are a little more comfortable going back to supermarkets and that farm stands are an outdoor place to shop and farmers markets are back. Um, also at CISO, we totally pivoted and with our partnership with the Franklin County CDC, uh, we personally raised $90,000 in the community and we did no interest loans. We have a pot of money we have together as two organizations of $400,000. And we've already done no interest loans to 17 farms, totaling $272,000. We'll turn around and probably do that again in a month. Um, what's kind of amazing about this year is, you know, it's a normal year for farming. So that means like, what's going wrong? We have a drought, but then on top of that, you have a pandemic. And that drought has had an impact independent of the pandemic. Um, it's affected the strawberry season. Um, it's affected the ability of dairy farms to grow hay because there was less water and they needed to bring in hay. So costs have increased and then costs have increased in terms of working safely on farms. Um, with my uh, legislators, uh, shout out to Representative Blay and Senator Cumberford, we were able to get free testing for anyone who worked on a farm at the Big E. Um, somehow supermarket workers were considered essential, but not people who worked on farms who were growing the food. And we also worked with uh, 
other organizations in uh, Franklin County to provide uh, a bulk purchasing of protective equipment. Um, we've been really concerned that again, the people who have the least ability to suffer are the ones who have suffered the most, whether it's people who are farm workers who are taking vans together, driving up to a farm and living in closer quarters, um, to beginning farmers who are just starting out. Um, so we've tried to be there for those folks. Um, I will say that demand for local food seems to be up statewide. And it does remind me of the recession in 2008, where that happened also, where people maybe had less resources, but they weren't traveling. And so they were putting more resources into what they were buying and what they were bringing into their houses and cooking more and doing more of that. Um, and I will say that um, other farms are struggling, like if you sell wholesale, that has been a struggle for lots of different reasons. And with the winter coming up, I have no idea how winter farmers markets are going to open, in part because some of them have been physically located in senior centers and public schools, and that will be challenging to open up in those places. Um, so I would say, uh, my big thank you to the legislature and to this caucus was for the 36 million that um, we all pulled out of the food security infrastructure grants uh, for funding the buy locals this year, which was not a given, so that we're able to help every farm who wants to sell direct to their neighbors to be able to do it throughout the Commonwealth and for funding HIP at a higher level, which we need to increase again, and also including more farmer vendors to make sure that every community in Massachusetts is able to use that additional benefit that comes with getting SNAP, which is getting $40 minimum of local produce from a local farmer vendor. I'd say moving forward, our concerns are, um, how do we maintain this increased interest in local food that did disappear 10 years ago after the recession? So if we're lucky enough to see ourselves moving out of the pandemic over the next 12 months, how do we remind people who is there to feed them and where that food came from? Um, how are we gonna help farms assess their options for next year? How much should they plant? What should their marketing decisions be? Um, I also already mentioned the winter markets. How are they gonna open? Spring, summer markets are challenged because less vendors and less shoppers for safety reasons. Um, and I am concerned about how overwhelmed the bureaucracy has been with the food security infrastructure grants. The round three just got announced maybe a week or two ago. That took nine weeks from when the proposals came in for them to announce it. And I do not see them finishing out apportioning the $36 million before mid-November. And the reason that's a challenge is you have farms and other businesses that got bids, and those bid prices will not stay the same. And um, a lot of those businesses need to know, are they upping food capacity come winter or not? So um, I have concerns about that. I'd say also moving forward, I hope we continue with this program somehow, some way, even if it's not at $36 million, because 1,300 applications came in Maybe they're going to be able to fund 300 out of the 1,300, which leaves 1,000 applications on the floor. Um, I hope that HIP gets the funding it needs moving forward. I hope it can, can be year round. And then I'm also aware that there are smaller programs, and CISA has one of these that depended on earmarks in the past, and I'm not sure we'll see it this year. And we have a senior farm chair of the program that feeds low income elders in the three counties and we're paying local farms to grow that food and to give that slice of the summer harvest. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Phil. Um, thanks for wrestling with the challenges uh, of this time. We appreciate it so much. Um, and I saw Senator Tarr uh, hop on and I wanna thank Senator Tarr for his leadership. Uh, he's been on for a while, but I wanted to thank you, uh, Senator Tarr, for your leadership of bringing fisheries uh, to the Senate side and, and elevating that issue for us, um, which you've done so beautifully. And with that, I'm going to welcome Frank um, to speak with us. Welcome, Frank. We're so happy you're here. 
Thank you, Senator Conrad. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I'm new to the game. Uh, I spent most of my life figuring how to get fish out of the ocean. I never really thought of them as food. I just thought of them as we were hunters, you know, so fish was what we hunted and we was very happy with a successful catch. So what I'm going to pro provide you here is a little bit different perspective. It goes back to the beginnings of when I fished, how the system has changed and how those changes in the system have changed the way that we perceive fish, not only now as a hunted prey, but as a source of food. Um, so I'm going to also give you a little bit of uh, background of the technical jargon. Uh, forgive me, but there's, there's just so much of it. Fishing is a really complicated business. It didn't used to be, but it, it's become so. Um, I'm a groundfish fisherman. Groundfish species comprise cod, haddock, pollock, cake, redfish, and four different flatfish species. Those are subdivided into regional stocks. My first experiences with commercial fishing began in 1962 uh, when uh, we were basically players in a, in a large worldwide fishery that took place off our shores with vessels from the USSR, Germany, Poland, and Spain fishing alongside us. By the 1970s, uh, an international movement had begun expanding territorial jurisdictions. You may or may not remember the Cod War between the United Kingdom and Iceland that took place in those days. In 1976, the US Congress enacted the Magnus and Stevens Act, uh, which declared a 200 nautical mile fisheries jurisdiction for the United States. And during that year and the succeeding years, many other nations did the same. Um, the uh, advent of the uh, extended jurisdiction and the opportunities that presented, plus bountiful subsidies and tax incentives, uh, precipitated a wave of new vessel construction in the United States. By the early 1980s, there were over 1,000 U.S. vessels pursuing ground fish. Ground fish landings grew from 80,000 metric tons to over 160,000 metric tons. However, while landings grew, uh, catch rates declined because of increased effort. By 1990, catches uh, had declined to 50,000 metric tons. Uh, by 1992, a lawsuit filed by the Conservation Law Foundation was settled which required the National Marine Fisheries Service, the federal regulatory agency, to end overfishing and to rebuild overfish stocks. Work began on a plan which was known then as Amendment 5 that froze permits at the current levels at about 1,200 and set a five to seven year timeline to rebuild depleted stocks by setting time limits called days at sea that each vessel could, each vessel could fish annually. By 2008, days at sea had been reduced from an initial 88 to as few as 30. Disputes raised as to whether this approach was effective. In 2008, the entity charged with fishery policy development, the New England Fishery Management Council, adopted a new system of quota management, which was to roll out in 2010. This new system created sectors. Sectors are what I'm here to talk about today. Under this system, each of about 1,200 qualifying permit holders received a prorated share of each of the 19 stocks of ground fish based on their initial contribution to the aggregate catch during a baseline period. Under this system, each permit holder may opt into joining a sector. There are now about 15 active sectors in the New England region. Those not wishing to join may fish in what is known as the common pool, which retains some of the attributes of the earlier days at sea system. 98% of ground fish landings are made by sector affiliated vessels. In a sector, a fisherman may opt to fish their quota allocations or may lease them to another sector affiliated fisherman. Each sector employs a sector manager who is responsible for accurate reporting of catches, management of quota, um, and to procure trades of quota from within their sector from, or from any other sector in the system. Since about 2013, fewer sector vessels are choosing to fish their quota. Some are now inactive from all fishing while others pursue fisheries such as lobsters. For many, the revenue from leasing quota has become an important source of uh, revenue to their uh, sustaining their lifestyle. As the fleet demographic ages and there are very few new entrants, quota lease revenue has become a source of retirement income for fishermen. Each year, National Marine Fishery Service sets annual catch limits for each managed stock. There is, these are established to prevent overfishing and were applicable to rebuild overfished stocks. 
In 2012, there was a drastic reduction in the Gulf of Maine card allocation. This plus reductions in other stocks totally disrupted the sector business model with catches and subsequent revenue, revenues declining to a point where it threatened sustainability. These pressures have taken their toll to where today only an estimated 120 active vessels fish for ground fish out of the original 1,200 qualifiers. However, the draconian limits imposed by NIMS have had a beneficial effect on stock condition. Almost all stocks, with a notable exception of cod, are rebuilt. Some stocks, particularly redfish and haddock, are at levels not seen in decades. With so few vessels fishing and with market demand contracted by restaurant and food service closures, we have entered a new era of underfishing. For example, during the 2019 fishing year, which is May 1st, 2019 through April 30, 2020, we caught only 43% of the available Gulf of Maine haddock, 45% of the redfish, and 8% of the pollock, cumulatively. By a very rough estimate, we are leaving 30 million pounds of fish uncaught annually. I am treasurer of Northeast Fishery Sector 12. This is a very small sector with five boats and 18 fishing permits, mostly located in situate. In 2019, we landed 450,000 pounds of ground fish amongst our five vessels. Uh, fish prices, which were weak due to the market dominance of imports, collapsed with the, two, with the COVID-19 pandemic. There were two drivers. First, the loss of the restaurant and food service sectors, and secondly, the loss of processing capacity due to business closures. We had already begun to address the paradox of catching more fish but at lower prices, often prices which didn't cover costs before the current crisis. We had established a nonprofit corporation and begun a partnership with Mulaney's Fish Market, a long established South Shore business, to process catches in situate and to establish a local brand to distinguish our catches from generic, often imported products. We had already begun donating fish for local charitable organizations to help a community which has always been supportive of its fishermen. The pandemic has strengthened our resolve. We now intend to use the nonprofit to purchase a portion of catches, which we will be donating to the Situate Food Pantry. We will be processing these at the Situate facility and converting them into consumer-ready portions. We are also working with the Situate Public Schools to provide local fish for their lunch program. We are fortunate to have several younger fishermen who will be able to carry these programs onward. We have also applied for four food security infrastructure grants, uh, those were mentioned earlier, and in aggregate, the fishing industry in Massachusetts that I know of has applied for 45 grants, mostly through the Massachusetts Fishermen's Partnership. We are anxious to convert the bounty of fish near our home ports into a resource that improves food security for all our members, uh, and we think that we are developing a program which is a constructive approach to achieving that end. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, I know as someone who doesn't know enough about fisheries in the Commonwealth, I'm really grateful for that overview that you provided us in addition to telling us where you are right now. Deeply grateful for I that. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. We appreciate you uh, being here, um, and I'm sure there'll be questions. I'm going to turn it over to Aaron, and then Winton will bring us home. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Senator. And um, Winton and Christina did a really excellent job laying um, the situation out. So I'm, I'm going to really try not to uh, share anything that's already been shared. Um, as you shared, Senator, Project Bread is a statewide anti hair organization connecting people and communities in our state to reliable sources of food while also advocating po for policies that make food more accessible. Um, we run the statewide food source hotline that um, helps callers identify different food resources that are available in 180 languages, confidential line. We work with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in operating the Child Nutrition Outreach Program. And with them right now, we're supporting meal sites across the state that are providing school meals. We have a healthcare partnership program where we work with health centers um, and receive referrals for, um, from them of their food insecure patients. And we lead on advocacy work. We are so grateful for the legislature's support for for these programs, for the food hotline and the child nutrition program um, in particular. So Christina shared some of the data um, around food insecurity. You know, those numbers translate into over a million people in Massachusetts who are right now facing food insecurity. 
Um, we still have one of the highest unemployment rates in the country. We are the sixth highest, and we know that the populations most impacted by this are workers in low wage, public facing jobs with fluctuating hours like retail and, and food service. We also know that when you peel the numbers back, there are certain groups that are more disproportionately impacted by food insecurity. One of those groups is children. Um, we, one in five households with children right now are food insecure. And we also know it's concentrated in Latinx and Black communities where those rates are doubled for, for households with children. So it, this is a real crisis. I share Christina's and echo her concerns that we might not be reaching um, all of these individuals. Like the food banks, we've seen a huge surge. We've seen um, six times the, the volume of calls to Project Red Food Hotline from um, summer of last year to summer of this year. So I'm gonna update you on some of the work that we've been doing specifically around the federal nutrition program. So as you know, before this crisis, um, kids received school meals at school. Those who either received free um, or reduced price received it as part of their school day. Right now, we are operating under universal school meals. Right now, any kid in Massachusetts, zero to 18, not just school age, zero to 18, is able to access meals at school meal sites across the state. In the spring, we set up 1,600 sites, and at peak, they were serving about 150,000 kids a day. These sites had to operate entirely new distribution models. They had to figure out how to do deliveries, how to do to go, um, and they brought in $42 million in federal funds. So these have been a critical, critical resource. The flexibilities that allowed these school meal sites operate were extended um, in August, and um, we are now advocating for them to be extended through the entire school year. Project Bread is sending out promotional materials to these sites, signage, scripts for robocalls, um, and we're also giving out grants to support their operations. Many have never provided to-go food, so even simple um, purchases like to-go bags have been essential. Some concerns we have are, are one, we need to keep getting the word out. A lot of families are not going to these sites. Um, a lot of families we hear feel like they shouldn't. They worry that they're taking something away from another family. That is not the case. These are the school meals their kids would be eating anyways. So we want to get as many families to go to these school meal sites as possible. Um, it's a program that can and should flex. So as we're seeing, um, as Christina mentioned, the strain on, on the food pantries, we absolutely should be sending um, folks to these school meal sites. We also need to continue to advocate for Congress to spend these favors. And the meal sites frankly need funding. The legislature included $5 million in supplemental budget. That is still held up in a and And then a lot of grant um, schools have applied for grants from that food security task force funding, which they also have not received yet. So they they can't make those investments until they have some um, security that they're gonna receive those funding. But from you, if you could just send as many folks as possible to these sites, um, help raise awareness about them. Project Red has a map on its website and also if anyone calls our food source hotline, we can share up to date information. We also have extended, um, the federal government has approved the extension of pandemic EBT, which provides an electronic card with a value of school meals on it. This has been provided to a half a million kids in Massachusetts. We know from research that this has significantly reduced food insecurity for the families that have received it. Last week, the president signed an extension of this program. Um, there's still a lot of confusion. It's a brand new program. It was launched in the midst of this crisis. Um, so if folks have questions about it, they can call Project Red Source Hotline. We're working closely with the Department of Transitional Assistance. And the one thing I would say is this is in addition to school meal sites. So um, I think there's sometimes a misconception that if you get PBT, you cannot go to the meal sites, but families should do both. If they are facing food insecurity, absolutely use the PEBT card at the grocery store, but still go to um, these school meal sites. Under SNAP, um, the good news is significant barriers have been eliminated, less paperwork to submit, less interviews. Um, as part of this, we've seen a huge increase. There's been a 400% increase in applications for SNAP, as well as EAFDC and EAEDC. Um, so, although that speaks to, you know, economic implications, um, this actually reflects the program is supposed to be. SNAP is intended to increase in a downturn. It has the ability to scale. Um, and right now, the folks that were receiving the $600 in unemployment assistance that expired at the end of July, we are trying to reach them um, to make sure that they know that SNAP can help fill a critical gap. So we want to continue to push people to it. 
Um, the federal government has approved the maximum allowable amount. So for a family of four, that's $646 a month. Um, SNAP can now be used for home delivered groceries. We received that approval several months ago. Um, so SNAP is a critical, critical lifeline. SNAP also makes you automatically eligible for PEBT. So um, EBT, WIC, and, and whatnot. So we really want to encourage all of you to continue to tell your constituents to consider applying. Our food service hotline is confidential, 180 languages. So um, we know there's a lot of folks that are scared, um, especially individuals who are immigrants who are just concerned about even applying. So we encourage, um, if you were on the phone with any of them, to call Project Red Food Service Hotline. We can do a confidential free screening. And if they are ineligible, we can also refer them to other resources. School meal sites are no questions asked, no identification required. Um, and finally, we are on SNAP continuing to push for an increase. Unfortunately, the benefit right now, um, although it's been maximized, it, it has not been maximized for families that already receive the maximum benefit. So a lot of those families are running out of SNAP benefits in the second or third week of the month and then turning to the food pantries. What we really want, we need is for those benefits to be extended. And right now that Congress has now passed twice legislation to increase SNAP by 15%. It's sitting on the desk of the US Senate and it's, it's held up in those negotiations that apparently have stalled um, as of yesterday. So we will continue pushing hard for that because it's critical. Um, finally, Project Red, in you know, response to all of this, we have been launching an awareness campaign because we are worried there are a lot of people out there that are not applying for these programs. For healthcare partnership work, we can see that 50% of the patients that we're working with um, at these health centers who are identified by their physicians as being food insecure have never applied for SNAP. So we really need to get um, the resources and the information out there about these programs. We're doing digital advertising on Facebook and WhatsApp. We have done um, mailings to homes. Um, we are, have billboards going up. We're doing everything we possibly can to just raise awareness about these programs. We're also doing a survey of 3,000 households around barriers to SNAP participation, just so we know what they, you know, we know what these historically been, but also in the midst of this crisis. So where we could use your help is continue to promote Project Fred's Food Source Hotline as a place that people can call. Um, and then the continued advocacy, you know, on the state level to release those critical funds that um, from both the staff budget and also from the task force fund and continue to partner with us on advocacy. The legislature has been incredible in sign on letters to its own papers, um, and we really need the federal government to move soon on um, extending staff benefits. So thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, I, uh, Rep. Farley Bouvier has uh, just typed a question. Winton's going to bring us on home, then we're going to get to your questions and comments. I feel like all of you have provided such a high level needed um, look into your sectors. I'm deeply grateful uh, with a lot of takeaways for us. So Winton, why don't you wrap up and then we'll get to questions like the one uh, texted here by uh, Rep. Farley Bouvier. So I, I just, I have to, I can't let the moment go by without just remarking on how lucky I am, am to be working with such incredible colleagues um, doing such important work around the state. And, and uh, it's hard to wrap all of that up. And bonus points to the fact that none of the speakers use the words pivot or disrupt, um, which I think we're all really tired of hearing, particularly in reference to the food system. So some, some, uh, some highlights of what we heard, definitely the need for more funding for programs like NEFAP and HIP. Um, and to make sure not only that, that that funding passes the legislature, but that that funding actually gets out the door to where it's needed after it passes. Um, talk about the need for support for better communication about available programs, particularly federal programs like SNAP, to help ensure that people who are in need of help uh, that aren't receiving services currently get that access. We talked about the infrastructure grants. And I'll add that there were 1,300 applications uh, for those infrastructure grants, more than any other state grant program ever, and that that indicates the need for more of that kind of support and also for faster turnaround on the responses for that report to, to help the farmers and other food system businesses that really need that funding. And also about the state needing to champion local food um, so that we don't see the same kind of, of, of drop off in interest as, as Phil talked about um, after the recession um, and helping to stabilize markets through regulations and incentives that aim to do that. 
So I would add that the, the advocacy world around food access in Massachusetts has really transformed in the last 10 years or so. Agriculture groups are talking about food access and wanting to make sure that they're feeding their communities equitably. Food security organizations are connecting with agriculture, recognizing the value of those connections with the local economy and of having that access to nutritious food. Healthcare advocates are more aware of food as medicine interventions than they ever were before. And there's other important collaborations happening throughout the food system. And the, the Food System Caucus has done that same kind of systems thinking in the legislature. And connecting those dots is really essential to shaping a sustainable, equitable, and resilient food system. So thank you all for your leadership in doing so. Thank you, uh, Winton, for bringing this home. Uh, Rep Farley Bouvier asks, uh, and I think this is for everyone, can you share your latest round of graphics? So Project Bread and the food banks and the buy locals, the fisheries, if you send them to our team, we'll make sure that the Food System Caucus gets it out, uh, gets out a big tranche of good educational stuff, um, information for the legislature. Thank you. Um, anybody else, just either raise your hand using the little reaction or raise your thumb, I think we can do, um, or type in that you'd like to ask a question. And Senator, I just want to add to, to um, MEFAP and HIP, funding also for Child Nutrition Outreach Program and Food Source Hotline are also both the funding already allocated to release it, but funding to handle the surge as well. Thank you. Just didn't want to miss out on that. <laughs> no, appreciate it. Um, questions or comments, if I don't see you, simply unmute and ask. I'm looking. Anybody have a question or comment that you would like to share? Senator Comerford. Yes. Mike Brady, how are you? Senator Brady. Thank, thanks for this. I will, I will say um, the, the, the meals at all the schools in my district have been working out fantastically, uh, helping out a lot of families in in the, the network and the, the word getting out, especially in the different languages from the diverse communities that we represent has been working out. And I wanna thank everybody on, on the panel. It's, it's been working out tremendously, but as we know, the restaurant industry is suffering. And I know we're trying to come up with some legislation to help that and expand on that. Because as, as we know, um, quite a few businesses and small businesses in the restaurant industry are gonna be they're currently closing as we speak and there there's future projections that they may be closing and I don't know if there's any ideas from the panel that you would give to us to think what we can do to move forward with that. The other thing is because of lack of rain, I know that the blueberry industry and even the cranberry industry may be affected of that because we've had such a dry season this past summer. So any ideas on, on those industries if anyone has anything Please. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brady. Anybody want to um, talk about the connection between the restaurant industry and your efforts or blueberries, cranberries? I'll just say about blueberries. I mean, bottom line is some farms have access to water and irrigation and it adds an hour to the day to do it. I think um, there's no way to make it rain more than it is. And I think though what can help again, and, and the State Department of Ag Resources did suggest that if people wanted to include in their food security grants um, a response to the drought, but that was sort of late in the game. So I think we do have to expect that we're gonna have years now of drought and years where it just rains every day for six months. And we're going to have to figure out how do we carry those water sources if you're not near a river or you don't have a functioning well. And I think it is appropriate for the state to be providing resources to help farms adjust to that. Um, in terms of restaurants, I'm deeply concerned. And um, for us, you know, our, our farms depend on restaurants to be buying and we depend on the restaurants to serve the best, freshest local ingredients, which are from local farms. And I'm very concerned about them getting through the winter. We've seen some local towns do fundraising in certain parts of Western Massachusetts that has been somewhat successful and have provided, you know, to 40 restaurants or 30 small businesses, two to $4,000, which will carry them two more weeks. But with the winter coming, I think it, it's gonna be very, very challenging. 
This is Erin. I um I don't have a great answer. I I we there is legislation pending at the federal level to allow SNAP recipients to use their benefits at restaurants, which obviously I think would be critical, knowing the numbers of people on SNAP. But um, it's very concerning. We are as an organization we're doing targeted outreach to the restaurant industry just to make sure the workers themselves are being supported and know about SNAP and are applying for SNAP. But um, there isn't always a clear connection for how we can um, connect the restaurants themselves to school meal programs as an example. I think the best opportunity is to allow SNAP beneficiaries to be able to use their benefits at restaurants. And I'm sure, I know Congressman McGovern um, has been championing that at the federal level. Yeah, and I know that some of the, because of the, the, the uh, coronavirus, there was some federal dollars that came into the Commonwealth to help the restaurant industry, but it was limited and it went it was gone as soon as it got here. And I know we're kind of all of us on a wait and see with what's going to happen with the federal government on a wide range of financial issues, not just this, the food industry, but, you know, a mortgage help, a rental help, et cetera. And it's, in, it's a very difficult situation for all of us because of the wait and see. So I know we're all trying to do what we can at the state level in the meantime, but um, any ideas that you have moving forward, please don't, hesitate to contact any of us so we can try to do what we can here in the Commonwealth and try to take care of the, ourselves the best we can without just waiting for the federal government to come up with a decision at the end, you know. Thank you, Senator. Sure. Um, agree. We can't wait for the federal government. Um, we've had a, a number of questions about what's going to be available in the winter in terms of food support. So, um, you know, Phil, you talked about not sh being sure about farmers, winter farmers markets. Folks are interested in, you know, what you're thinking about uh, the pop-ups, especially those focused in food deserts, if, if we expect those to continue. Um, and uh, there's a number of folks asking again for more resources, the links that they can send out to their communities about where the meal sites will be, especially in the winter. Uh, months where the food pickups will be, what food banks have to offer, things like that. Um, so I, I'll just quickly say for winter farmers markets that, um, you know, in some cases, if you're outside like a restaurant, you're going to have to provide heating to some degree so people can come and shop there. And I know that there have been some requests made through the food security infrastructure grants. But again, I'm worried they're not going to find out till mid-November or later, and that is too late in terms of a market manager deciding whether to open or not. So, um, and, I, and I hope it doesn't go as challenging as, as it did for local boards of health, which are really important to make sure that people are safe. But now we have a little bit of experience around people buying food in indoor spaces. So. I hope that won't be as big a lift. I would just continue to push Project Bread and the Food Source Hotline. We have a COVID-19 resource page, but the Food Source Hotline is also the most up-to-date information. We know which school meal sites are open, which days, we have a map for that, but we also are in touch with all of the HIP providers. We keep that information so we know which farmers markets are still open. Um, and in touch with the food pantries as well. So we really try to keep that information because it does change um, pretty, pretty often. So um, rather than trying to share with you all of the changes that might happen, I would continue to push that out to your constituents who um, in that moment might need the most up-to-date resources. Thank you, Erin. And we'll get, the, we'll get the most recent graphics that you all have out to the legislature. Um, Senator Tarr. Thank you, Senator. I was just uh, struggling to find the unmute button, but um, thanks to you and to, to Representative Kane, to all of the leadership of this particular caucus, I think it's critically important to have the discussion that's being had here today. I appreciate the updates that have been given. Uh, I think they're very important to our consideration about how to strengthen the security of the food network. Certainly, uh, we're going to face some challenges, but it's good to go into those knowing what's going on. And I particularly want to thank Frank um, for his outstanding overview of what the fishing industry has been going through over the last uh, few decades. The point that I wanted to seize upon, however, is that we are in a real turning point for the commercial fishing industry in Massachusetts, because as you heard Frank indicate, we have a lot of underexploited food fish species that we could be doing better with. 
But what's changing is we're losing our traditional markets. In Massachusetts, a lot of the fish that is caught fresh usually would wind up on a white tablecloth in a restaurant. And those opportunities have diminished significantly. And so what we're all working on is really going in two directions. One is trying to make uh, open more marketing channels directly to the consumer with a consumer friendly but higher end product that they might be interested in that they have not necessarily had access to in the past. But the second one is the one that I just wanted to mention briefly here. And that is because of the CARES Act, we've come upon a program uh, from the federal government, from the Department of Agriculture, where we can essentially tell them we would like them to buy some food product uh, from the fishing industry and others for that matter. But for the purposes of this discussion, I'll focus on the fishing industry. And so we're working to be able to build a case to USDA to say we need you to buy some more fish for distribution to institutions. And of course, that's where the nexus is with the many of the people that are on this call, because we'd love to be able to work together to talk about what are the characteristics of that fish product that would be usable uh, for our food banks and our food pantries. And, and what we've heard early on is that the product has to be uh, in a ready to heat and serve kind of fashion. It, we can't really be sending uh, you know, large quantities of uh, freshly caught codfish to the local food pantry because there isn't the capability to process it. So we already understand that it needs to be something that is in a much more processed form. And there are a lot of processors working to stand up that capacity as we speak. But what we'd like to do is continue to have the conversation in the future about how to take those species that Frank mentioned and convert them into a fresh, a really nutritious and really beneficial food product that can go to people in Massachusetts that was caught by people in Massachusetts and processed in our state. Hopefully we can make the case to get the federal government to provide resources to make that happen. So I just throw it out here. This is a real turning point for the commercial fishing industry. We think that even though we've got a lot of challenges, there is tremendous potential to reopen channels to less the consumers rather than having them rely on imported fish, which all too often has been the case over the last you know, couple of, you know, 20 years or so, a couple of decades. So I'll leave it at that, but I just wanted to put it on everyone's radar screen. Thank you so much, Senator Tarr, and thank you for your leadership, along with Rep Peek and so many other people um, for our fisheries. Thank you so much. And I know Rep Kane's been in those trenches as well. Um, Rep Peek, did you have a, did you want to, make a statement, ask a question? Yeah, if I could just briefly, uh, just to piggyback on what Senator uh, Tarr uh, so accurately described as what our needs are for uh, processing fish. I do know uh, down here on the Outer Cape, there are uh, two different organizations that are doing just that. They have received some grant funding to support it, and some of it is just supported through private philanthropy. Uh, one group is buying uh, quahogs or hard-shelled clams, uh, largely that come out of Wellfleet Harbor, processing those into chowder, freezing the chowder, and it's being distributed to food pantries throughout Barnstable County. Um, certainly a program like that with more money could be expanded uh, in, a, in a greater way. Because interestingly enough, the shellfish industry has been hit harder, at least initially, than the finfish industry. Because people do cook things like cod and haddock and uh, fluke and flounder at home but there are fewer people that know how to open an oyster or uh, how to cook a clam or, 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 or open a clam and, and that type of thing. So that's been helpful. And then there's a, a group uh, in partnership with the Mass Massachusetts Fishing Partnership based out of Chatham that is doing something similar with Haddock. And uh, I don't know what the processing is that Frank had talked about, but the way they're processing it, simple also, that also becomes fish chowder and is frozen. And then those frozen, they're like in these boiling bag kind of things. All you have to do, you can pick them up frozen at your food pantry, you put them in boiling water, and uh, the things thaw out and you have a, a delicious bowl of nutritious, uh, locally processed, locally caught, supporting your local fishermen uh, meal that is available for people uh, who are hungry. So I think there's probably little models like that going on all along our, our beautiful Massachusetts coastline. 
and uh, to the degree that at the state level and the federal level, we can support them so they're not dependent upon local philanthropy. I think that that would be an important thing to do. Thank you so much. Um, uh, oh, Christina, do you want to make a comment? And then I think we have to wrap up. Okay, I just wanted to make a quick comment to the previous two comments by the senators. Thank you so much. Um, we have been very lucky in Western Mass to be the beneficiaries of one pallet of haddock chowder that was donated to us uh, from a, a collective of fishermen, I believe on the Upper Cape, um, as, as sort of a pilot to see how it would go. And it flew out the door. Folks loved it. So, and I know that that also happened at the other food banks. So we've really been talking about, could we take some of our MEFAP funding and put that towards uh, purchasing some of these fish products that you're talking about? Um, we would need some additional funding above what we're currently getting in order to do that, but we would be very interested in doing that. Yeah, I think that's the program my, my, uh, my guys at the Fisherman's Alliance have, have put together out of Chatham. Well, it was delicious. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's a great way to close this call. Um, very heartwarming. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Rep. Dom is urging us on to prioritize. Thank you, Mindy, uh, to prioritize MEFAP. And uh, Rep. Kane is talking about also prioritizing HIP, which House members have begun that advocacy. And thank you so much for that. Um, thank you to the panel. I really feel like we've just gotten a big gift and a big boost and a big shove forward. Uh, to continue the work of food security on behalf of the Food Systems Caucus Chairs. I want to thank you so much for your service um, and thank you also for you really informing us uh, for, and I see Senator Gobi's hands up clapping. Um, we are going to send out a lot of follow-up information from the Food Systems Caucus. Please be sure um, to uh, stay tuned and as always hit us up if we can be useful um, and that's reps uh, Kane Schmidt and Donahue in the House, me and The Rock and Ann Gobi and Eric Lesser in the Senate. Um, so thank you everybody um, and be well. <laughs>